first of all, could you tell us a little bit about your background and how you became interested in researching transgender issues and advocating for free speech and, and freedom of belief as, as your case ultimately went on to do? I was working at an international development think tank and in 2018 when the UK government was consulting on reforming the Gender Recognition Act, I wanted to talk about it and tweet about it politely uh, and I lost my job. And so I took my employer to tribunal on a belief discrimination case saying that they should not discriminate against people who believe the totally ordinary belief that sex is, there are two sexes, sex is real, sex matters. Um, and I lost. Uh, and JK Rowling tweeted about it, made it internationally famous, and then I appealed and I won. And so that created a precedent, which means people shouldn't be discriminated against at work for having this belief, which is the completely normal belief that your grandmother has about there being men and women. <laughs> Yeah, not, not exactly known for extremism, grannies, I, I would imagine. No, exactly. I mean, they call this a philosophical belief, but it really is a very basic belief uh, that most people hold that, that sex is real. Uh, if, if anything, you could probably argue that the alternative belief is one that's more sort of ideological and, and unusual. That, that's true and in my case we also pleaded that the other belief was also protected because you know in a workplace everyone people have different beliefs you have Muslims you have Christians you have atheists and they should all be able to get along and do their job and so my case showed that both beliefs are protected and lack of belief is protected so it's not that one group has more rights than others it's that employers shouldn't discriminate against anyone for having a, a, a belief about sex and gender. Now, there's probably going to be a lot of people at home watching this who are in a work environment where they feel like they can't speak out about these issues, who maybe they see somebody's pronouns or they hear about some of the more extreme elements of transgender ideology and they don't necessarily buy into it themselves, but they know that if they were to say anything, there would be serious repercussions. Uh, I mean, uh, just here in Ireland, the uh, Garda Commissioner, our, our head of the police force, uh, he was about to roll out a policy which would mean that if officers didn't use a person's preferred pronouns, they could be disciplined. And uh, after intense backlash, he rode back on that policy, but it was on the way to being implemented. So what advice would you have to somebody who is in that position where they feel like they are uh, constrained to say what they believe to be obviously true? I think the thing to do is, if they can, is to challenge the policy. Don't have a fight with the individual. Don't make it about an individual. Uh, take up the policy and and uh, refer to my case, which although it was a case in the UK, it relies on the European Convention on Human Rights, on freedom of belief and freedom of speech. So it's, it's persuasive in other countries. Um, take the argument up about the policy rather than waiting until you know, till you're face to face with a customer. You know, you need to treat everyone with respect. Um, but at the same time, it's better to have a job than an employment tribunal. So really only do it if you can afford um, to take the battle on. Um, what do you see as some of the potential risks and harms to society of policies and laws that require individuals to use preferred pronouns and affirm uh, people's identities? So when we're talking about compelled speech, things of that nature. As you say, it's compelled speech. It's like asking somebody to say, uh, you know, a prayer that they don't believe in. People shouldn't have to do that in order to keep their job. And then particularly where people's jobs involve safeguarding, or involve children, or involve vulnerable people, or involve anything where they need to be able to say, this is a man and this is a woman, because they're looking after changing rooms, for example, in a gym. You know, if you can't say those things clearly, then you can't protect people, and often you can't do your job. Obviously, this has uh, serious practical implications, as you say, people being in the same changing room as somebody of the opposite sex has a major impact on people on a human level. But do you think that there's uh, something deeper here where it, it comes down to, are we going to be a society that acknowledges the truth, you know, almost in a philosophical way, as you mentioned earlier, that there's, there's something kind of foundational here to the kind of society we want to be? Yeah, I think if you can't if you can't speak the truth, then something is seriously wrong. And and you know, it's such a foundational truth that there are two sexes. Uh, you know, it's like two plus two equals four. <laughs> there are men and there are women. If we can't say that without being in fear of our jobs, then we're living in an authoritarian state.